Obviously, just uh, following the really uh, horrific news out of Israel and the the juxtaposition of now over 60 people being killed, 90 in the past, uh, I guess, three weeks, uh, over a thousand injured, and the sort of images coming out of the embassy as if it was the royal palace. And um, we will uh, talk to Yusuf. Uh, Meneer about that. And I would also say uh, this. Um, May 15th is the date of what Palestinians refer to as Nakba. We'll, we'll talk about that with Youssef. It doesn't, uh, most Americans are not terribly familiar with the term. It translates ro- ro- loosely into the catastrophe. It is the day that is marked when uh, Palestinians were driven from their homes uh, in the course of who would become Israelis, I guess, um, cleansing them from areas around Jerusalem and other areas in what ultimately became Israel. Uh, There's not a lot of history of this that is available to uh, us in the United States uh, because... uh, People have not uh, chose to highlight that history. However, if you go back um, to the February 11th, 2013 interview I did with Benny Bruner um, on his documentary called The Great Book Robbery, you can look at, I think this, the the Great Book Robbery is probably online, if not on YouTube, uh, certainly somewhere for free. And it details just one slice of of what took place at that time. But the idea being that we hear a lot that there was no Palestinian culture. There was no Palestinian society that existed there. It was as if there was just a bunch of Bedouins uh, in the, the desert. And that is not the case. And... I mean, even if it were, that would not be a justification. Uh, no, uh, but the you know the, a lot of people argue that well, there's no right of return because there was really no there there, and um, it is worth looking up this film, uh, watching it, uh, the Great Book Robbery, because it's about frankly the um, the books and the libraries that. Um, that people had in that uh, region. And um, you can learn a lot more about the, the actual society that did exist there. Um, I don't know if there's like some uh, human, I, I don't know if there's, the, the, to get into arguments about that, it inevitably uh, um, evolves around like, there are no such thing as Palestinians. They don't exist. <laughs> Uh, they're Jordanians or they're this. No, there, in fact, was um, a, if not a recognized country per se, although it was Palestine, um, but there certainly was a, a nationality, if you will. Or uh, So uh, check that out, and we will uh, get to Yusuf um, shortly. Uh, we should probably just show you some footage of what has been going on there. Now, the... The story that the White House has been telling, and we'll talk to Youssef more about this, but the story that the White House has been telling is that there was, the Israelis had reason to believe that hundreds of thousands of Hamas-encouraged Palestinians were amassing on the border and were ready to, uh, I guess, charge the, the fences. And... There seems to be zero evidence of that. Were there people there protesting? Yes, as there had been for weeks. Were there more? Maybe. I don't know. A couple thousand? Some of those people had slingshots, all right? Uh, Yeah. We actually also, I think, do we have an image of um, uh, one guy with a slingshot uh, from his wheelchair? He had uh, lost his legs, I guess, at a... um, Do we have that picture? We never pulled it. Um, And yeah, here it is. And 
it's unclear to me what this guy's name was because uh, I've seen two different names attributed to him. He was shot. As you can see him uh, throwing that uh, slingshot, he has no legs. So probably not a huge threat uh, to the state of Israel uh, with that slingshot there. Uh, there was a baby, uh, eight months old, who was killed. Um, here are pictures of uh, IDF, the Israeli Defense Force, so-called, firing tear gas at Palestinian protesters uh, with the use of a drone. Uh, so there's the drone right there, you can see. And then they drop uh, tear gas canisters just dropping down on people like, well, they also function as, uh, as bombs. But, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm not great with crowd numbers, but we're looking at a thousand people, maybe. And if they were, of course, um, crashing the fences, then you wouldn't need a drone to drop the tear gas on them. You'd be able to throw it at them. Um, let's play the... Uh, here is a video of Nikki Haley, the um, U.S. ambassador to the United Nations. This is on uh, today. That the relocation of the U.S. embassy in Israel from Tel Aviv was not to blame for the deadly... Well, let's listen to what she has to say. I mean, it is the case that there have been uh, protesters there for uh, weeks... Because for years, they have been suffering all sorts of deprivation, running from food shortages to um, uh, unemployment that I think is almost incalculable. I mean, it's almost, it's, almost, it's, it's almost easier to calculate employment than it is unemployment there. Right. And, and, because and it's a smaller number, the employment. And lack of medical supplies even. I mean, even David Cameron, just this point of like global comparison of how everybody else understands this issue called it an open-air prison and said it was unacceptable. And we'll, we'll talk to Yusef uh, Moneer about uh, the implications of the embassy. But that, that basically uh, was the U.S. signal to the Israelis that, like, anything goes. But here is uh, Nikki Haley uh, blaming Hamas for the violence, I guess. I don't know how that works. But let's remember that the Hamas terrorist organization has been inciting violence for years, long before the United States decided to move our embassy. In recent days, multiple news organizations have documented the Hamas incitement in Gaza. They have reported that Hamas maps and social media show the fastest routes to reach Israeli communities in case demonstrators make it through the security fence. They have reported on Hamas messages over loudspeakers that urge demonstrators to burst through the fence, falsely claiming Israeli soldiers were fleeing, when in fact they were not. The same loudspeakers are used by Hamas to urge the crowds to, quote, get closer, get closer to the security fence. <laughs> Hamas has attacked the Karim Shalom crossing, the biggest entry point in Gaza for fuel, food, and medical supplies. This is how determined they are to make the lives of the Palestinian people miserable. They light Molotov cocktails attached to kites on fire and attempt to fly them into Israel to cause as much destruction as possible. When asked yesterday why he put a swastika on his burning kite, the terrorist responded, quote, the Jews go crazy when you mention Hitler. Unquote. This is what is endangering the people of Gaza. Make no mistake, Hamas is pleased with the results from yesterday. I asked my colleagues here in the Security Council, who among us would accept this type of activity on your border? No one would. No country in this chamber would act with more restraint than Israel has. Oh my God. Uh, so let me see if I get this straight. The terrorists are using kites 
to threaten this uh, country. Uh, kites and megaphones. And the Israelis are using sniper fire and, um, Drone. and drones. Um, and, I, I mean, it's just, it's absurd on its face. It's absurd on its face. I can't believe we're even, she's even able to deliver that stuff with it, without sort of cracking up. Honestly, just say we support Israeli apartheid and rampant abuses at all times I mean, because that's just uh, slingshots and bullhorns. I mean, I mean, how could you? She's be, literally how could saying you be? the terrorist wrote a mean thing they, on the kite, a, and it was ladies super and gentlemen. Triggering, and that's why over sixty people needed to be slaughtered protesting their just imprisonment. Just imagine, triggering. just imagine if the. A, a thousand Mexican people lined up on the border of of, uh, of Texas and Mexico and had a kite that said, Dirty Gringo. Can well, you imagine? Well, now that you say that, I would say we would need to obviously slaughter and massacre all of those Mexicans. I mean, I think that's a given. But the, you know, here's the other thought experiment I'd like to run. Damn Yankee. Could you imagine if... We were in a historical situation where there was a community of Jewish people in Gaza and the West Bank that were con controlled by and, and occupied by a military and expansionist settlers in the West Bank and in Gaza couldn't get medical supplies and were killed with impunity you know, at any time the occupying government wanted. That would be rightfully a global crisis of anti-Semitism. A neighborhood in Vosa. <laughs> exactly. And then they started flying kites over. And saying stuff like, they, dirty crowds. When you make fun of Hitler's mustache, we get upset. This is what the Jewish leadership wanted. We would have no desire to do this. I also would say, I just want to also add that, you know, South Africa, whatever the flaws in government, the ANC is still the ANC and the Party of Liberation. They withdrew their ambassador and... People should note that. Uh, Sinn Féin has called for it in, in Ireland, too. Yeah, and they, people I, should also know that just you know Desmond Tutu, Ronnie Casrills, everybody said it's the same situation.